So hello, everybody. I am here with Gauthier Pierrozac. Gauthier is a uh, lover of symbolism, you know, very fascinating person in himself. And he went on a very, a really exciting journey to uh, dive into and discover the works of uh, Louis Charbonneau Lassé. Many people don't, you might not know about him. He was an early 20th century symbolist, uh, very important, influential, but because of the war and because of many things that were happening around him, some of his work got lost and uh, some of it got forgotten. There is an English uh, version of his main work that we know about, which is The Bestiary of Christ, a highly edited version. His French version is quite longer and more, uh, is fuller. Uh, and Gauthier is now involved in a new publication called The Vulnerary of Christ, in which uh, this is Chabonneau's work on the symbolism of the five wounds of Christ and just how universal they are and how extended that language kind of becomes in Christianity. And so it's a very, it's a very fascinating book to be published right now, a very important one. And so I'm really looking forward to diving into his discovery of Chabonneau and also, uh, and also the work itself. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So, Gauthier, maybe you can start off very simply and tell us how you became interested in the work of uh, Louis Chabonneau Lassé. Yes, uh, thanks for inviting me to your, to your podcast. Um, I, I've been very interested in symbolism and Christian symbolism in particular since I was very young. Um, I was introduced to this through the fact that I lived in France. I lived in a little tiny village with a church that was uh, over a thousand years old, and there were symbols engraved on the outside of the church. And of course, it started my curiosity and I, I kept, you know, there's a lot of people who were along the way who, who, who advised me to read which book and that book. And um, over the years, I was becoming more interested in the, the bigger aspect of symbolism. It's not just limited to, to, to Christianity. It's just to, the way I'm looking at it, um, it is a language based on intuition. Uh, you use symbolism when you cannot express with words some concepts that are just divine. Or, uh, and, and the best example, and I'll, I'm going to bring that back later, is the concept of infinity. Our brain cannot comprehend infinity. We can get close to it. We can use with words. We can try to explain, but we cannot define it. I think symbolism um, allows you to go a step above with communication of this concept. And I'm, mm. I'm sure you, you, you understand there's patterns surrounding us that, that cannot be explained, but we can feel them intuitively. So that was my approach. I also have kind of a specialty. My brain sees in colors. I see letters in colors. I see depth when I listen to music. So oh. I'm, I realized after a while, it's, I think it's a known condition, that I have already in my brain a wire that bypasses language. And so <laughs> that's why I really appreciate uh, symbolism. So in the process, I was reading um, uh, René Guénon, which is a, a perennialist in France, and found out that he was uh, involved with a Christian publication in the early, mid 1920s called Regnabit. Regnabit was, um, a periodical, a monthly, uh, where it was dedicated to the sacred heart of Jesus. Everything about it, from doctrines, symbol, art, philosophy, poetry, anything. And within this periodical was a gentleman named Louis Charbonneau Lassé that started engraving for the periodical. He was doing the the, the wooden engravings, and they would print these symbols, mm. these representations. That's how he started, okay. participating in 1921, I believe it was. After a while, he started writing articles about uh, some of his findings. So what's very interesting is that Louis Chabonneau Lassé was born in 1871. So he's a 19th century kind of a, a old school uh, gentleman. Um, he joined early 
I think he was 11 years old when he joined uh, a Christian school. Uh, he stayed there constantly and, and wanted to become a priest. <clears throat> and he just became a teacher in that school, started to, trying to become a priest. And in 1903, uh, a law in France just separated uh, uh, church from the state officially. And the, the, the congregation he was part of was uh, disappeared, simply disappeared. So he ended up being back in into uh, the secular life, if you want. And um, at that time, and it is so interesting how little details can change some people's lives. One of his teachers at the congregation he was part of was also an archeologist, or mm -hmm. maybe early at that time, they were kind of digging around and finding stuff they didn't expect. They would dig under old stones, you know, standing stones. They would find uh, skeletons and a lot of old <clears throat> artifacts. And uh, he became very interested in this. I have some old writing of his where in the early 1900s, he was actually exploring underground caves hmm. where people during the past wars, religious wars and all that, they were hiding and they would leave artifacts behind. So it's an interesting aspect because he became an archaeologist, which is a scientist, while being truly a, a Christian, um, a true Christian, and by the way, a Catholic, but uh, very uh, interested in, in um, all sorts of symbolism. So he, he found on his own all these artifacts. He started questioning why he was finding, uh, there was really a lot of representation of Christ through animals, through all sorts of symbols. And that's what the bestiary of Christ is. It's really interesting. In, so fast forward in the 1920s, he became part of that uh, periodical Regnabit. And he started using his finding, archeological findings to write about the symbolism of Christian artifacts. So he would talk about the lion, he would talk about the, the, the bull, um, and he would also explore, and that's the interesting part for the vulnerary, all the symbolism of the heart of Jesus. And his biggest mystery for him is how come I'm finding artifacts that are, that are hundreds of years, um, they were showing the heart of Jesus, even though the doctrine of the sacred heart only appeared in the, in the 17th century. So that's where his own quest started there. And um, it took us... Uh, and we'll talk about it if you want very deep in this book. Yeah. And so he, he was working in collaboration even until I guess the end of, I, I don't know who, who passed away first, but until the end of their lives, he worked in collaboration with Gino. Yes. Uh, in this kind of rediscovery of symbolism. Yep. And, uh, and this is what kind of led to the, the bestiary. And so he really is a, I would say one of the, he was one of the key figures in the sense that, there was a lot of symbolism thinking happening, obviously, at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, but a lot mm -hmm. of it was in the in, a, in the stranger world, the world of the kind of esoteric world and the yes. world of um, you know, philosophy yeah. and all of these kinds of worlds. But but Charbonneau Lassé really wanted to frame his understanding of symbolism with, within his Catholicism and his Christianity. Yeah, yeah, I call that is he was an orthodox Catholic. <laughs> orthodox yeah. Catholic. He was very very careful not to, to steer into occultism, esotericism, and all that. However, him and Geno became really good friends. So as I mentioned, through different people who knew each other, they were introduced. And um, Charbonneau and Geno met. Uh, Geno went to his house in uh, Loudun and saw all his artifacts. Mm. And in fact, when you, what you see through their correspondence until the from 1924 to 1946, when Charbonneau Lassé died before Guénon, Guénon was helping Charbonneau by providing findings of his about uh, Christian symbolism. He would give him everything. Mm. He would even support the publication of the bestiary of Christ. Even though Guénon at that time was a Muslim, he would give everything to Charbonneau because he thought that was an extraordinary project. In fact, he was asking Charbonneau for uh, his opinion on Christian symbolism. And Charbonneau would ask Guénon for other 
traditions uh, interpretation because one symbol can be interpreted many ways depending mm. on the context. So it was an interesting collaboration of respects. However, they would keep their ground uh, separate. Yeah, separate. Because Chabonneau, even though, you know, talking about Guénaud, even though he is clearly Catholic and Orthodox, he's also not afraid to point to the places where these similar structures appear in other cultures. He's not also kind of a... Correct. You know, he's not close-minded and focused only on his thing, but really sees through the Christian lens, even some symbolism coming from ancient pagan cultures or from yeah. other cultures as well. Yeah, and I think that came from his archaeology background, but also from Geno. Yeah. Uh, I have actually, uh, we'll talk about this later, but I have you know all these archives that Charbonneau left behind, and there is hundreds of notes of when he met with Geno and they talked about this subject or another. It was fascinating. So this is, the, this is the Indiana Jones now <laughs> yes. part of the story. So tell yeah. us what happened to his work and, and also your part in rediscovering it. Yeah. So you asked me earlier, and I didn't never answer how I found out about Chabonneau. So I was reading Guénon, and I was talking to some friends of mine who say, hey, you should buy the best theory of Christ. So that was mid-90s. Mm. And um, so I did. Uh, I purchased the best theory of Christ. And found it fascinating. I read it from beginning to end, even though it looks like kind of a dictionary almost. Yeah. Every every uh, animal is, uh, is, is listed with a symbol and based on. But I read it as a whole, and I came out of this book with a very strange feeling. And I don't know how the English version is. It's been shortened. Yeah, my- that's a pro- Yeah, uh, there's a project of doing a new version. I'd be involved as well. We're going to translate the whole thing. Um, but after I finished reading the book, I was, sh- I had a kind of a, an experience of suddenly I was looking outside and I love being in the woods and all that. And everything, suddenly I realized everything could symbolize Christ. Mm. The, the, the grand, not just the man, but the, the God Child of nature. You know? Yeah. The nature. You basically. Yeah. That's right. So we started with the animals and it just blew my mind and I wanted to know more. So that's when I started doing some of my own research. I had some access to Geno's uh, letters that uh, an Italian uh, scholar, Pier Luigi Zocatelli, had yeah. published, he published a few books. So I contacted this gentleman and um, we became friends. And um, uh, and that's how I, I learned through him and, and uh, that, Chabonneau had planned to write other books. The best year was one of several. He was going to write another book about the symbolism of the plants and vegetable, uh, vegetables for, uh, that represent Christ in any way possible. And a third book about uh, uh, minerals. But that's not it. What I found out through the archives, he was going to write books about all the items. They were anything, liturgic objects, uh, um, planets and stars. I mean, it was anything that could exist which represent Christ. And that's kind of an interesting approach to, uh, instead of apophatism, when you cannot uh, express God, God without talking negatively about him, he took another approach where the infinity of God is expressed to the infinity of all the manifestation of everything on earth and the universe. I thought that was fascinating. I've never seen that before. And that's, that's been my passion. So I was wondering, and that's where it was interesting, what happened to those archives? Um, so I was actually uh, working at that time. It was early 2010 with uh, the Geno family. I was uh, gathering all the writing of Geno and all his letters because I was, I was just curious. And in the process, they shared with me some letters they had of Chabonneau Lassé that were kept in Cairo, in Egypt, where Guénon finished his life. And they shared those letters with me. So I could, I, I had them in my hand and I was reading the letters and I realized there was that book, The Vulnerary of Christ, that he finished uh, just before his death. He was very old. He was in late seventies. He was complaining to Guénon that his eyes didn't work very well. Uh, the... A publishing company had lost a lot of his engravings. He had to redo 60 or 70 of those. It was, it was fascinating. And he was telling the whole uh, table of content of the book. And it was 
very interesting because what I found out is that that book had been stolen after his death. We don't know the condition. We don't know anything. But somebody came to the, uh, the people who owned all the archives of Charbonneau, and he borrowed the manuscript saying he was going to publish it, and he was never found again. Wow. Yeah. So um, what I did, uh, I, I tracked those archives. I, I, I contacted the the family, so they shared a lot of things with me, but they didn't have those archives. Mm. And this brings us to a very mysterious and kind of a, a Indiana Jones story is that, I don't know if you know that, but there is somebody who helped Chabono with the symbolism of the Middle Age, Middle Age, medieval symbolism of the Sacred Heart and all the symbols in the bestiary. Uh, one of Chabono's mentor, he was a a priest nearby named uh, Théophile Barbeau. I may have a picture of him. I'll share that with you uh, yeah. for the audience. And this gentleman was very old. Um, uh, Chabonneau was helping him, just like he was very uh, helping him with his with his day to day um, kind of. He, he, he couldn't write, so he would write for him. He was very old, uh, and that gentleman. Théophile Barbeau shared with Chabonneau that he was part of a, a, an organization of Christians called Etoile Internel. Mm. And that was kind of an organization of a few people. I'm not going to say a secret organization because that's really not fair, but kind of an organization of a few people who, who were carrying archives from the Middle Age. It was very strange. And, it's, it's, it, and they, were, they shared that information with Chabonneau so he could write about it because the content was in, in line with what Chabonneau was studying, mm. the symbolism of animals, the symbolism of the, the sacred hearts. So they gave him, they, he, this old man gave him their archives to study. <clears throat> and he, they also had carried through the Middle Age some kind of a knight, knighthood uh, ritual Mm -hmm. It was called the Chevalier du Paraclet, the, the, the Knights of the Holy Spirit, if you want. Uh, just some kind of a, a group of people like that who would protect that knowledge. And they made Charbonneau, uh, he, he transmitted to Charbonneau the, basically that the right to make new knights. Yeah, so, so he was included, he was brought into this. Yes, yes. So after his death, he left all his archives to the few of those knights that still lived at the time. And they were, by the way, friends of René Guénon. So it was a small group. Yeah. Their goal, and I found out in the letter, was to use the archives to finish the work of Charbonneau. They're going to finish the book about the, 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 the plants, the book about the minerals, and, uh, but they, they didn't, uh, the, the group died, everybody, yeah. uh, it, it didn't survive. It, it just, just. It fizzled. Away. Yeah. That's what fizzled. I heard. Yeah. So those archives were still in the position of <laughs> the last of those nights. Uh, I think he's um, a friend of the last of the nights after he died in 1999, uh, sold those archives to publishers in Italy. It's just strange. Crazy. Interestingly, the owner of those archives was the one who published the bestiary of Christ in, um, in the 80s or 70s in the French version. There yeah. was a facsimile. His name was uh, Laszlo Tots. He was the director of the uh, Arche editions. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he's the one I've met. And um, first he showed them to me um, so I could consult and he wanted, he, he was supporting me. He wanted me to help reconstitute the books because he was 80 years old when I met him. Mm. He passed, he passed away a few weeks ago. A few, oh, couple sorry. Of months ago. Yeah. yeah. And he, um, and, uh, in the end I negotiated, Hey, can I, can I own them? Uh, can I buy them from you? So we agreed on a price, but I could not afford that price. Because first of <laughs> my wife didn't want me to spend all money. That. Yeah on that garbage <laughs> and, uh, 
and I respected that. So what I did is uh, I say, well, what if I did a crowdfunding project? Okay. Where I ask all the traditionalists around the world to uh, hold on. I think my dog wants to come join us <laughs> to to see if they wanted to help. And they did, and we did that. 2016, I started the uh, crowd crowdfunding project, and in um, two weeks, I had wow. the money. Two weeks. <clears throat> so I, I I bought the archives. It was sent to me, and now I have uh, I mean hundreds of folders. And I'm going to share that with you. It's mm. really I'm going to show you a little bit. So for example, this one is about the Byzantine Letimazi. Yeah, the intimacy. Yeah, intimacy. So it has these notes. So I'm going to try to show you. So it's just a, so it's made of. So it's interesting because we're talking about the 1930s, 1940s. Yeah. So this is shipping paper. It was recycling paper that was used. Uh, you know, originally, that symbol was for the mountain. Okay. But it, the content exactly. became. Um, yeah. So we have some yeah, engravings. Yeah. 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 And it's at the back of letters, so you can see. Uh, I may have some Ronnie Gannon, there's a hundred of them. And then he, he talks about the content. And so it's been plenty of notes. So it's well, all organized by symbol, like organized by, symbol. by subject. Wow, by symbol. And then there is, yeah, like he would recycle some, some of his own writings and um, there's some beautiful things. So it's for an artist. Yeah. And, and for an artist, it, it is an extraordinary mine of information and inspiration. So what I decided to do and that's important you may not know that in exchange for the for getting the funds my goal is to share that with everybody mm. so for the past three years i have scanned every single of those archives and they are now available there's about forty thousand notes for everyone i have a website called uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you the link archive chabonolacé.org yeah, and you can have access to everything. So that's my role is to share. That's really what it is. It's amazing. But, um, so, but there's a lot of. So you've been able of, to scan the entire archives, and yeah, it took these me are years. All his engravings, all the drawings are his. Yes, own. Oh my all God. of them. It's and I, I even have some uh, some some things I'm going to show you. So it's beautiful. Like he did some engravings of the oh, wow, the holy land. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, this is the this is called the Rosa Mystica, nineteen twenty three. Yeah, some so, of the these are more stylized, very beautiful. Yes, they are. They are. And then he has. It's funny. He was keeping track of all his engravings. He's done thousands in sheets that he would just print them, so he would remember what he had. Uh huh. For right. Example, right. Right. Yeah, this is one of the underground he was exploring when he was. Uh, these Maybe caves. 19, yeah, his caves. So there's some of that. There's some uh, all kind of uh, all kind of stuff. It's it's just incredible. It's just incredible. And there's a museum in France, Chabonau Lassé. It's in Loudun. Mm -hmm. uh, they have inherited all. Well, these archives went to the Knights of the Paraclet. Everything he found archaeologically wise is at a museum in in Loudun. So mm -hmm. I contacted them and we became really close. They gave me access to, they kept, they still have the engravings, the pieces of wood wow. that he engraved with a knife. He was done with a knife. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. <laughs> so now the books so or the vulnerary, were you able to recover the manuscript or did you reconstruct it? Good question. I'm still not, so, <laughs> so that's going back to the Indiana Jones. So, when I, when I saw in the letters he sent to Gain on the table of content, and I realized I had a lot of, because he, even for the bestiary, a lot of the chapters were published separately in the periodical over yeah. 10 years. He had, he modified them a little later, but he done the same with the, the content of vulnerary. Okay. And, and so I was, I started collecting everything he, he, he published because I found some stuff from the 1910s, some 1936, it was all over. But I, because I had the table of content, I knew what to look for. Mm. So I had to reconstitute some of it, and I had to, and I was able to reuse some of what he published. But my original goal was: I'm going to publish a reconstituted vulnerary. It doesn't matter if it's accurate. I want the person who stole it 
to come out and say, hey, this is not right. I have the manuscript. It never happened. Never happened. <laughs> no, never happened. I don't know where it is. Huh. Well, it's a strange world too. It's a, it's a, it's a world of secrets. So sometimes yes. there are people involved in these circles that, uh, that find power and secrecy. And so I agree. I agree. I agree. And one of those is, yeah, it's being part of a group. You, I, I do not know what happened with that manuscript. Obviously the person who took it is probably not alive anymore. This yeah. was another generation. Uh, but I, I have hints. I mean, I have a name. Um, the goal is to, my quest is not over. <laughs> <laughs> That's astounding. That's yeah. really amazing. Uh, wow. This is, it's such a, it's such a great story also because, you know, I also had my, you know, my interest in Chabonneau, uh, of course, early on when I became interested in symbolism, you know, because he was far more Christian and far more, and I was, that, that was the direction that I was taking. And so obviously the bestiary was an important part of my, hmm. the kind of my formation and, and even just the possibility of thinking about medieval symbolism and, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, Western, Western medieval imagery is often more emblematic and so it's it's even more it's more easily interpreted in the way that Guinot would interpret symbolism, almost in a geometric way. And yeah. so I can really see I could really see how Chabonneau and him would would uh, come together quite quite well in terms of uh, bringing out Christian symbolism. So this so it's wonderful to see these books coming out, and and also there are future projects that you're putting yes. together. I'm working on reconstituting the, the lap, lapidary of Christ, lapidary from uh, stones. Yeah. Uh, and I've started, uh, so it's, it's, I am amazed at what he gathered. I'm putting this together in French now. Of course, it will be translated in English after that because French is my original language. It's also the, all these notes are in French, but um, right now just studying just the basic rock um, for example, the rock symbolizes something that is indestructible, right? I even go even further. Think about the diamond, yeah. the diamond stone. I'm writing an article about this. I'll love to share it with you when it's published. The diamond, um, I don't know if you knew that, but nobody knew how to cut a diamond until the 15th century yeah. when... Uh, with technologies, people were able to use diamonds to cut diamonds. But back in the early ages, a diamond was found in the rough and it was indestructible. They could not break it. The hammer would bounce out of it um, and, and you couldn't do anything. And it's, when it comes naturally, it has the form of an octagon, yeah. kind of a diamond shape, you know, diamond, that's why. But when you look at the symbolism, uh, and I just finished, studying this, Charbonneau identified that because the diamond stone is indestructible, it symbolizes the, the indivisibility. God cannot be divided. In fact, I would say even further, the God is without dimensions. Therefore, you cannot cut it. You cannot divide it. You cannot measure it. But that's what the diamond was symbolizing. And... Um, and, and what's interesting is that the diamond can only be cut by itself. And it, there were some old symbolism where the diamond was associated to Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because the symbol, you know, when he was on the cross, he let that happen to him. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the uh, Old Testament, when Moses uh, used a staff, to hit a rock and water comes out of it to, to, yeah. to help the, the Jews. This is actually a prefiguration of Christ on the cross uh, where he, he, he died to, to redeem the world. Well, what's interesting is you can see that a lot with the symbolism of the rock in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, Moses goes to the top of a mountain to go see God uh, in the old legends. <clears throat> the diamond could only be found in an eastern mountain at the very top. Okay. And you could um, make yeah, sense. Yeah. yeah, in terms of the symbolism, it makes sense. It's almost like it's a heavenly stone almost. Yeah. It's right. And and the last thing is, you know, uh, there's that story where uh, uh, the, the the builders they reject 
that stone that looks like nothing, and that yeah. becomes the stone that you use, the capstone, to finish a church or a vault or whatever. So the capstone symbol end up symbolizing Christ because he was rejected by anyone, but he was the most precious stone of all, where everything holds because of him. So we found old manuscript, medieval manuscripts, where the shape of a diamond was put at the top of a vault the same way. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's an just amazing, one. Yeah, it's an amazing joining <laughs> of all the symbolism together. Yeah. I remember this that was one, one, of the, one of the insights that I got from Guénon, which is that the idea of the rejecting stone becomes the cornerstone. That's how we That's used right. to understand That's it. Right. But Guénon really brought about the idea that, no, it's the, it's the capstone or the key That's of the capstone. arch. You know, it's the idea of this last stone that you put in, which holds it together. And I thought... That's it. And since then, like, there's no... I could never interpret it differently. It just uh, it That's makes it. so much That's sense. It. But the idea of having this diamond... You know, this uh -huh. image of the diamond at the top in, in, the, in the vault is, uh, is wonderful in terms of indivisibility and this heavenly stone that comes down. That's great stuff. Yeah, I'll send that to you. That way you can show your audience. With I the, definitely, with definitely will. So that's a very exciting project. So you've got several exciting projects to, uh, to, uh, to, to still work on. Yeah. It's probably a lifetime and I probably won't finish it and I'll pass it on to somebody else. And that seems like that's what happened to me. There was a generation who tried they started, I have a lot of notes and all that from others, pass it on to me. I was able to publish the Vulnerary and I'll try to continue and pass it on to others. But, yeah, it's uh, wonderful. Yeah. And, and you haven't had any, you haven't had much resistance, which is great. Like the, the or maybe you have, you didn't just didn't tell us. Um, well, I'm, I'm not very public, you know, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I, when I talk to Christians in general, that are friends of mine who don't understand symbolism, they think it's paganism. They think it's uh, yeah, you know, all kind of you stuff. Know. But yeah. It, it, yeah, so I don't talk about this <laughs> only with people who can understand. Um, now, in private, I have I'm working right now with a, a small group in Argentina who are Christians. They love symbolism. And they are translating the vulnerary right now. So I'm helping them. I'm sharing those archives with them. And we're going to publish that one probably at the end of the year, the Spanish version of the vulnerary. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I found that in, in, uh, in South America, there's some interesting, uh, in Brazil as well, there's an interesting resurgence of symbolic thinking, which is, which is definitely worth uh, in being invested in. Yeah. That's really amazing. Um, so and so you also, I uh, maybe my last question because you mentioned that you were you were working with the Gino family as yes. well in terms of of uh, collating some of the letters. Is that a project you're still involved with? So I did it for them. Um, no, I'm not involved anymore. Uh, that was a few years ago. Uh, they had a kind of a they called a foundation where they would uh, uh, attempt to get basically they wanted to publish all the work of Gino uh, revised, but <clears throat> they, this project has stopped. Uh, Geno's work is going to be in the public domain next year, January 2022. And I think at that time, it's going to be completely uh, free for all. Basically, everybody's going to publish whatever they want, unfortunately. But I, I had access to all those letters. Of course, there's a lot of confidentiality. You know, it's, it's, it's for them. Yeah. But I, 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 yeah, I, I had access to a lot of letters. <laughs> and by the way, I have a website again uh, where I actually put all the Geno's work in French, including the correspondence, all the letters uh, for all to access. And this website is really, I mean, it's 10 years old now. It has thousands of visitors every day. And I believe it helps bring Geno's work to the masses, if you want, in some ways. Uh, but um, really, my... I mean, I live in the United States. I've been here for 20 years. My goal was to try to bring uh, some of Guénon, but mostly Charbonneau's work to the Anglo-Saxon or the English-speaking world. And that's, I, I was very impressed when, uh, Anglo, I mean, Angelico Quest, I don't know if you knew that. When I tried to get my crowdfunding going on, I sent a few emails in the United States, a few people I knew. Uh, one person who helped me was James Kutzinger. Have you yeah. heard of James Kutzinger? Yeah, yeah. I'm friends. I was friends with James Kutzinger. I made, I made some, even some pieces for the end of his life. In terms oh, wow. Of, yeah. Yeah. So he helped me very early on, mm. uh, early in the 2000s. When I was early, I didn't even know about Charbonneau and all that, but I was kind of guided towards the symbolism of the hearts. 
yeah. which is the center, which is everything. He's one of those who helped me. And when I uh, contacted him to say, hey, I'm doing a crowdfunding, crowdfunding, he sent it to a few other people. There's very few in the United States, in North America. You probably know them all. But one of them was John Shampoo, John Shampoo, um, who um, uh, could not, well, he offered, instead of the crowdfunding to give me money, he said, what if I translate the vulnerary in English for you? Oh. And that's what he did. It took him years. Amazing. And, and then he contacted Angelico Press. We worked together. We did another crowdfunding so we could pay for this, but it, it went really well. So it is definitely a walk of passion. We don't do that for the money. Nobody buys this book. <laughs> you know, it will never... It won't, it won't those... be a bestseller, but it, it, no, no, it, no. it will have a, it will have an impact. Uh, I hope I think... so. So everybody, you need to you need to get it. I'm still working through it. It's a it's a massive book. It's heavily documented. It has it has hundreds, I think, like at least a hundred images of all the different engraving that Chabonu Lassé uh, has done. And so it's really a wonderful book. And it's really like I said, Chabonu Lassé is really, in terms of my work, a, a precursor, someone who laid the foundation for symbolic thinking in the Christian world. And so we're we're very grateful. For him and Gauthier, very grateful for the work you're doing and looking forward to seeing it uh, continue to flower. So thanks. Yeah, no problem. And uh, I will send you the link to the archives and, and um, never hesitate. If you want me to look for something in the archives, I'll, I'll send them to you. I was the other day you walked on that uh, St. Christopher with a dog head. Dog headed man. Yeah. And I found that in these archives as well. So I thought it was cool. I remember wow. seeing that image in the early Bessieri edition, yeah. like the French edition. I, that was actually probably the first time I ever yeah. saw that image was in Chabonneau's early, uh, like the French edition, the, the facsimile one. That, yeah. that was like, just it was it was massive, that book. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. That's awesome. Yeah, so, it. so, so it's great. And yeah, for now, like I think that, uh, yeah, it's an opening for people to look into medieval symbolism. And like I said, for everybody who's interested in symbolism, you know, he was our, he's our ancestor in the, in the spiritual way. So, so look into the vulnerary and the bestiary, looking forward to the full publication of the book and all the future projects. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me.